Welcome, listeners, to the Everlasting Stories podcast, presented by Sick Semper Serpent Books in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm your host, Michael Strand. And I am very excited to bring to you a brand new story series titled The News from Crate by Nathaniel Hicklin. The News from Crate follows the exploits of a young woman named Wilma Dunn, who is kind of lost in life and searching for something. And that's when her uncle passes away, her favorite beloved uncle. And he leaves her something, a house in a town named Crate. And she decides to go there. And once she arrives in this town, so many fantastic and bizarre things start to happen to her. I just can't wait to read this series. Now, I'm going to begin with the first six stories. But if you go to patreon.com slash six semper serpent, you can read a few more now and more will be added all the time. In addition to gaining full access to the entire Everlasting Stories archive at patreon.com slash six semper serpent for $1 a month for just $3 a month, you can get early access to this podcast and hear brand new episodes weeks before anyone else. And I just want to thank each and every one of our patrons on Patreon.com for supporting us and subscribing. It really helps us out. And without your support, this podcast would definitely not be possible. So, thank you. All right, let's get started, shall we? Coming up from the Six Emperor Serpent News Desk... This is The News from Crate by Nathaniel Hicklin. Number one, welcome to Crate. When the second long brown envelope arrived in the mail, Wilma Dunn recognized it immediately. The bizarre coding in the upper corner where the return address should be was a dead giveaway. She didn't know what the code meant, but if it was anything like the first package, it had something to do with her uncle Amos. She'd always gotten along well with her uncle. He didn't visit very often, but whenever he did, the two of them would go off into their own little world. One time, he brought an album full of old discontinued coins, three cent pieces and golden half eagles, and told her all about the coins people used to use before it all got standardized back in the 30s or something. Another time, he took her all around her parents' house and spent all day showing her how the plumbing worked. He showed her where the water came in and how it connected to the water heater and where all the little valves were, and he showed her how to change the sink trap. He never liked to talk about what he actually did, though, Whenever her mom and dad tried to bring it up, he always brushed it off as nothing interesting and changed the subject. Wilma had a kind of friendship with her uncle that she didn't have with anyone else in her family. That's why it hit her so hard when she got that first envelope, which contained a letter from his lawyer saying that Uncle Amos had died. The envelope arrived at her dorm at college, addressed to her at her dorm room, It had a weird hash of characters instead of postage and a few lines of scattered characters instead of a return address. And inside, she found a brief letter from a lawyer named Latimer Fernico. She thought it an odd name, but Wilma had let it pass. No one trying to send her junk mail would make up a name like that. The first brief paragraph mentioned that her uncle had passed away, which had come as a shock but the shock was at least normal. This kind of thing happened. The second paragraph, well, was a lot weirder and a lot longer. It said that some of the complexities of her uncle's last will and testament would require some time to manage, but he had made provisions for her needs in the interim. 
the rest of the paragraph was a long string of words that Wilma couldn't quite follow without the help of some legal and financial-themed online help forums, but the short version was that Latimer Fernico had arranged some kind of trust to pay her bills until he sorted out the rest of the will. She wasn't being given a blank check to go on a worldwide shopping spree or anything. She just wouldn't have to worry about any of her usual expenses, at least for a while. The weird part, though, was that once Latimer Fernico had done whatever paperwork he needed to do, he would be transferring considerable assets, property, and what he called confidences into her control. Wilma had immediately called her parents about the letter, just to make sure no cruel bastard was pranking her with a fake death notice slash sweepstakes win. But as soon as she told them about the weird envelope, they knew exactly what she was talking about. They had gotten one just like it, and they were even more confused than she was. The letter had just said that Amos had passed away, that Latimer Fernico was sending a few small sentimental items that he had left them by express delivery, and that they were welcome to arrange a memorial service if they wished. They had no way to get in touch with Fernico to discuss the will or even to arrange to view the remains. When Wilma asked more about the will, all they said was that Amos had left them a few things that he had kept as mementos of his childhood with Wilma's father as brothers. There was no mention of any money or the trust Fernico had told her about. There was certainly no hint that Latimer Fernico would get back in touch with them about any further aspects of the will. Wilma didn't quite know how to tell them that Uncle Amos was letting her into something that he was still keeping secret from them, so the rest of the phone call passed without incident. Her parents wanted to have some kind of private service or dinner to commemorate Uncle Amos, but Wilma wasn't really paying attention. Wilma had no idea what Uncle Amos's lifestyle had been like. She didn't know how much money he made doing whatever it is he did. She hadn't even been to his house before. All of a sudden, though, he was paying all of her bills, and his lawyer was finding a way to tell her what kind of business he had been involved in for her whole life. It was the kind of revelation that needed thinking over. Quitting her lousy part-time job to focus on the rest of the semester didn't do it. Taking a break from school instead of automatically enrolling for the next semester, helped a little. Trying out hobby after hobby in search of something that fit her was really helpful. But try as she might, she never really found anything that fulfilled her. She kept checking her bank account every week, too, just in case that whatever had happened suddenly wore off. But it never did. She never got a single bill sent her way that hadn't already been paid by Latimer Fernico's mysterious arrangement. That was where Wilma's head was at when the second envelope arrived with the weird codes in place of postage and a return address. The letter was addressed to the apartment that she had moved into after taking a break from college. Somehow, Whoever sent the envelope knew where she lived, the same way they knew her account number. Inside the envelope, she found another letter from Latimer Fernico. As soon as she saw his name, her pulse quickened. But before she read the rest of the letter, she forced herself to take a step back and slow down for a moment. Her first instinct was to believe that this letter would lead her to whatever it was that she'd been looking for since leaving college. But she had to remind herself that she had absolutely no rational reason to think that. She couldn't allow herself to get too excited about this letter. It might not even have anything to do with the will. Maybe the money was about to run out or something. She opened the letter and started reading. It was a lot shorter than the first one. Latimer Fernico had finished arranging whatever it was he had to arrange, and her uncle's legacy was ready for her to assume control. All she had to do was go to the town of Crate and find him there, and he would tell her everything. There was nothing in the letter about where the town of Crate was, but as soon as she was done reading the letter, her phone chimed. Apparently, it had started downloading and installing a new update for her navigation app. 
Every time Wilma thought that she was getting to the bottom of something, every time she thought she had an answer to a question about her uncle, three or four more questions came out. As expected, she was about to find out what her uncle had been keeping from everyone. She felt even more apprehensive than ever about how weird it was getting. If she was going to venture any further into this thing, she was going to need some backup. Half an hour later, she was sipping coffee with her best friend, Dot Vander, at one of their local haunts. So, let me see if I have this, said Dot, holding her hands in an attempt to mentally sculpt what Wilma had just told her so it would fit into her head better. Your uncle, your cool uncle, who taught you a lot of neat stuff but had a mysterious life and an even more mysterious career, has died and given you enough money to live on until his affairs are ready for you to take over? Yeah, that's about it, said Wilma. As far as I can tell, anyway, I won't know exactly what's in store until I walk into his lawyer's office, but yeah. Right, said Dot. Latimer Fernico, the lawyer. Right, because that's a real name that real people have. Really, said Wilma, that's what you think is weird? I get magic money in the bank, untraceable mail at my door, an unidentifiable navigation app on my phone from people that I don't know and haven't met. But you're right. The name of my uncle's executor is really the weird thing here. Well, yeah, that's all pretty weird. But that name, though, huh? Wilma and Dot went off on that tangent for about 15 minutes. They did that kind of thing a lot. It was mostly why they got along so well. So... There's a lot of weird stuff here, said Dot, once the side conversation had run out of steam. Did you just want to keep me in the loop, or do you want my two cents, or or what? I don't know, said Wilma. I guess I just wanted to bounce it off you. I'm still trying to figure out what to think about all of this. It's kind of a lot to absorb. (laughs) Yeah, you're telling me, said Dot. If it were me, though, I would totally go check it out at the very least. I'd be all over that. That was the other reason why Wilma liked Dot so much. Ever since the two had been roommates in college, Dot had never been bent out of shape or bothered about anything. If something seemed like it might be fun, she went for it, all the way. She didn't even give a second thought about her major at school. As long as she was able to enjoy herself when she wasn't working, the actual work she did made no difference. She seemed incapable of not coping with whatever came her way. She'd agreed that the situation with her uncle was a lot to swallow, but she had come to terms in one sitting with something that had taken Wilma months to accommodate. Oh, well, I totally intend to go, said Wilma. I mean, it's good to know that you agree. Makes me feel a little better about it. But... That isn't exactly why I wanted to ask you here. Actually, I was wondering if you wanted to go along with me. Dot raised her eyebrows and leaned closer with a giant grin on her face. Intriguing. Do go on. Okay, look, your spring semester is almost up, right? Yeah. So how about a sweet summer road trip when your finals are done? We'll pack up for a few days. We'll drive to Crate, wherever that is, and then we'll see what's up. If there's nothing worth buying into, then we'll have ourselves a fun time on the road, and I'll probably end up re-enrolling for the fall. If I think it's worth sticking around, then I stick around, for at least a little while, till I see what it's like. Either way, it sounds like you'd have some fun, right? Dot took a deep drink from her coffee, eyeing Wilma in a playfully devious way. So you're saying that you'd like to ride to Crate so that you can inherit a mysterious secret thing, and in return, you and I can spend summer at a place where they have super weird letters? Wilma went over the conversation in her head. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Dot nodded and smiled. Sounds good.
Several days later, Wilma found herself speeding along the highway in the passenger seat of Dot's car, following the route to Crate that had appeared on her phone. Dot had made a mixtape, and the two of them sang along at the top of their lungs. When the exit pinged in Wilma's phone, she let Dot know to make the turn, and they veered off the highway onto a long country road in the middle of some field. There was a small town near the interchange, but the directions told them to go the other way, away from the gas station and the fast food joints, and towards nothing but miles of road out to the horizon. One final speck of hesitation in Wilma began to suspect that the directions might be wrong, but after everything that had led her to this path, she would have been more suspicious if Crate turned out to be just a normal town. Besides, the whole idea of going on a spontaneous road trip would have been completely bizarre to her a year ago, and yet here she was, in the middle of nowhere, on her way to a mysterious town with her best friend to keep her company and to have her back. Who cared if the directions were wrong? They had plenty of gas, and the road had to go somewhere, right? It was late in the afternoon when the music suddenly stopped, and so did the engine. Dot noticed the car start to sputter and slow down. She leaned forward to look at the instrument panel. What happened? asked Wilma. I don't know, said Dot. The car just shut down. We didn't run out of gas, did we? Well, the needle is on E, but I could have sworn that we had half a tank a minute ago. Well, maybe the engine stalled. At highway speed? Hey, I'm just spitballing here. Dot pulled over to the shoulder as the car coasted to a stop. She tried turning the key again, but the engine wouldn't even try to turn over. It was just a click. The two of them got out of the car to stretch their legs. A pleasantly cool breeze blew. The hottest part of the day had already come and gone. Nice day for it anyway, said Dot. I almost don't mind that we don't have A.C. out here. Wilma popped the hood and lifted it for a look. Uncle Amos hadn't exactly ever given her a guided tour under the hood of a car before, but he had told her about the basics once. Well, there's no smoke or anything from the coolant, so it didn't overheat, she said. The serpentine belt is still in one piece, and all of the gauges suddenly went dead, and the engine stopped firing. It kind of sounds like it should be electrical, but the leads to the battery are in good shape. Maybe it's a bad alternator or something? Dot was fiddling with her phone, pointing it at various parts of the sky as though she were looking for coins on the beach. I'll take your word for it, but all I heard from that is get a tow truck. But I can't get any bars on my phone. Can you? Wilma pulled out her phone. Nope, me neither. I don't suppose you have any tools or emergency gear in your trunk? I think I've established that I don't have much use for tools, unless I wanted to jingle them together and listen to the noise. I've got a woolly blanket and a box of energy bars, though. Maybe we can spend summer camping and working on our tans. They decided to spread the blanket across the back end of the car and just lie back and watch the clouds with one ear on the road in case anyone noticed their hood raised in the international signal for roadside assistance. It was at least an hour before they heard another engine approach, but fatefully, it was actually a tow truck. Both of them felt a little unnerved that a tow truck just happened to be driving along this isolated stretch of road coming from the direction that they had been going, but Wilma felt a sizzle in her spine when the truck got closer and she could see the name on the door. Wolfgang Turns Automotive Services. She had gotten used to trusting anything associated with her uncle, and anyone with a name like that had to be involved. The truck stopped well ahead of them and reversed across the highway to align its rear end with Dot's bumper in what was obviously a well-practiced maneuver. When it shut off its engine and the door opened, Wilma and Dot got their first look at Wolfgang Turn. Evening, ladies, he said. Anything I can do to help? Wilma assumed 
that the average small town tow truck driver would be a folksy old guy around 45 or 50 with an encyclopedic knowledge of American engines and maybe a slight mistrust of anything made in the last three decades. But Wolfgang Turn was not cut from that cloth. He wore a slightly old-fashioned but excessively clean overall, complete with the name Wolfgang, embroidered above the breast pocket. But he couldn't have been much more than 30. His hair was freshly slicked back, his teeth gleamed white, and he wore something on his wrist that almost looked like a smartwatch. Wilma could tell that Dot was surprised to see him because she could see her eyelashes fluttering and the corners of her mouth turning up. Uh, yeah, said Dot. We, um... She seemed to be having trouble remembering what words were for. Our car quit an hour ago, said Wilma. I think we might have some electrical issues. Would you mind giving us a tow? Well, I sure wouldn't mind, said Wolfgang. But I should probably take a look at her first. See if I can fix her right here, you know? Oh, sure. Go right ahead, said Wilma. She and Dot stepped aside as Wolfgang stepped up to the hood of Dot's car and pulled something out of his pocket. He bent over the car and reached in, his shirt sleeves riding up on his arms a little, revealing some quality muscle tone, which made Wilma and Dot waggle their eyebrows at each other. Wilma turned to look around, while Dot was clearly enjoying the view, and noticed something else. Wolfgang's truck didn't have a license plate. There was some kind of narrow metal bar on the rear bumper, with a pattern of holes and raised bumps, but there was nothing resembling ordinary registration. Yeah, you're not wrong, said Wolfgang when he was done. This is a garage job for sure. I'll tell you what, my shop is just down the road there, in the next town over. How about you two hop into the old extended cab here and I'll see what I can do for you. He opened the rear door of his truck and Wilma and Dot climbed in after folding their blanket. Even the guy's back seat was unusually well-groomed. It smelled like a floral candle. The tow truck purred like a kitten as they traveled along, but Wolfgang didn't make any attempt at conversation. He seemed like the type to enjoy casual small talk with strangers, but he said nothing. He just fiddled with some of the knobs on the dashboard. The silence was just beginning to feel awkward when a chirp came from Wolfgang's watch. He looked down and he gave a little gasp that Wilma would have ignored if she hadn't been paying attention. When he looked back up at the road, he had regained his composure, as though nothing had happened. So, what brings you ladies out to our neck of the woods? said Wolfgang. Oh, just looking for a good time, Wolfgang, said Dot. Wilma heard that there might be something worth doing out here. Actually, said Wilma, I got a letter saying that my uncle had died and some of what he left me was to be found here. Oh, said Wolfgang. Well, I sure am sorry to hear about your uncle. I appreciate it, said Wilma. But it was actually a few months ago now. I guess the lawyer needed some time to get his affairs in order. He only just sent me the official invite the other day. Well, said Wolfgang, I can't say I know more than one lawyer. You wouldn't mean Latimer Fernaco, would you? That's the very lawyer, said Wilma. Dot looked at her with a jerk, but Wilma felt the pieces were starting to fall into place. Once we reach your garage, I'd love it if you could direct us to his office. I'm supposed to meet him as soon as I arrive. That won't be a problem at all, ma'am, said Wolfgang. He pointed out the windshield to a billboard that peeked out from behind a hill. See, there you go. We're almost there. As they sped past, Wilma and Dot got a clear look at the sign. It was made of inlaid sheets of metal shaped to look like painted wood, and all it said was, Welcome to Crate. Once Wolfgang got the car into the garage, he gave Wilma and Dot directions to Latimer Fernaco's office in town. Each grabbed a bag from the car, and they headed out. 
It seemed, if nothing else, picturesque and quaint. Kind of what they were expecting, but every now and again, one of them spotted a little something out of the corner of the eye that didn't quite fit. Maybe it was a lamppost that had some odd ornamentation on the top. One or two cars drove by that felt either too old or too modern, or some weird mixture of both. Latimer Ferneco's office was on one of the main streets, close to the square in the center of town. Wilma stepped up onto the stoop, bag in hand, and rang the bell. The door was opened promptly by a dignified gentleman in a three-piece suit. He had a full head of silvery gray hair, and his eyes were two different colors. Ah, hello, said the gentleman, taking Wilma by the hand and shaking it warmly. You must be Wilma Dunn. I'm Latimer Fineco, legal counsel to the town of Crate and the executor of your uncle's estate. Please, please come in. My deepest condolences, once again, for your loss. Amos, he was a very dear friend to all of us, and he thought the world of you. He ushered Wilma and Dot into his office with more ceremony than was necessary, sweeping them through the building with a tidal wave of civility. He showed them to a pair of well-stuffed chairs and took his own seat behind the oversized desk. Really, it's a pleasure to finally meet you at last, said Ferneco, pouring on the graciousness like maple syrup, and you must be Dot Vander. Any friend of Miss Dunn is a friend of ours, I'm sure. He offered his hand, but Dot backed away a little. How did you know my name? Wolfgang informed us that Miss Dunn had brought a guest. As you may have realized, Miss Dunn, we try to be careful about the people that we invite to our little town. But you seem to be very much our sort of person. Miss Vander, so please stay in Crate for as long as you like. Wilma, I'm not sure if I'm cool with this, said Dot. This is kind of some CIA stuff or something. Oh, come on, Dot, said Wilma. I'm sure it's fine. If you are truly uncomfortable, Miss Vander, said Ferneco, then you are perfectly free to leave as soon as Wolfgang has repaired your car. After I sign some kind of document on pain of death, right? Said Dot. Or after you wipe my memory with some weird drug? Ferneco smiled and shook his head. It wasn't a sinister smile. It was just him being friendly. Oh, gosh. No drugs, no signing anything. Our friends, they come and go as they please. I'd be willing to wager, however, that you'll find a reason to stay here before the day is done. I assume there's something you need me to sign, though. Right? said Wilma. Uh, yes, yes, of course, said Ferneco. He opened a drawer of his desk and pulled out a long sheet of paper. He had some kind of sprocket holes down the sides, and at the top was the same kind of hashed code that she had seen on the two brown envelopes. She made sure to read every word, but the language was refreshingly clear. Once she signed at the bottom... She would take complete ownership of the property of Amos Dunn, including financial holdings and real estate. She would also assume all of his obligations and duties pursuant to his position within the town of Crate. What's this part about obligations? said Wilma. What obligations would I be assuming? Mr. Dunn held a position of some esteem in our town council, said Ferneco. Along with myself and a few others, I'll gladly introduce you to them at your ledger, but, barring that, you'll meet them all at the next meeting after your appointment to your uncle's position is made official. As for his obligations, he selected you as his successor with the certain knowledge that you would be up to the challenge. Well, can you tell me anything about what exactly I have to do? Ferneco seemed uneasy for the first time since opening his front door. Um, the nature of our obligations is such that only the person in question is fully aware of the details. None of us can simply be told what is expected of us. All we can do is whatever comes naturally to us, 
and hope that it will be what is needed. Make sense? No. What kind of job description is that? The only one anyone really gets, sadly, Freneko said somewhat apologetically. No one here can tell you how to do your uncle's job, but if he left the job to you, then he certainly already told you everything you need to know to do it. It was humbling for Wilma to have that kind of confidence at her back. She was beginning to understand why Uncle Amos had doted on her so much over the years, why he had spent so much time teaching her things. Maybe it was all some kind of well, training for this job of his, but she wanted to honor his memory. There was only one thing to do. She took Fernico's fine inlaid pen and signed on the dotted line. Excellent, said Fernico, rolling up the document. Welcome to Crate. He stood and offered his hand, and Wilma shook it. Most of your uncle's things are kept in the house, but the most important items are kept here, according to the official procedure. If you follow me. He went to a room that adjoined his office and sat down at a small table that held an ornate chess set with a board and pieces made of metal that seemed to change color as Wilma walked around it. He placed pieces on the board in certain specific positions. Wilma only hazily remembered Uncle Amos's chess lessons, but she could still recognize that Ferneco wasn't placing the pieces in legal positions. With the last piece in place, the board split in two and folded apart. The pieces held fast, stuck in position. The mechanized board revealed beneath it a large panel with what looked like a keyhole. From beneath his waistcoat, Ferneco pulled a brass-colored medallion. He held it in his pudgy hands and pressed a raised section of it. Suddenly, the bottom half of the medallion twisted and unfolded as though it were on springs, extending an array of rods and sprockets from a central spine. When the weird transformation was complete, Ferneco inserted the thing into the keyhole and twisted. A loud clanking came from the adjacent wall, and a section slid out to reveal a set of heavy steel shelves. Resting on one of the shelves was another medallion, just like Ferneco's, except it was bright and silvery instead of brassy like his. He removed it from the shelf and handed it to Wilma, handling it with both hands, as though it were an Academy Award. She took it from him and hung the strap around her neck. As she did so, she could tell that Ferneco was getting excited, as though she were riding her first bicycle. Your badge of office and your will, he said. There are some things around town meant for council use only. This will grant you access to them. It officially identifies you as a member of the town council. So basically this is my official key, and I don't ever take it off, said Wilma. Right, said Ferneco. You saw me use mine, and they'll all work in a similar fashion. Some things will accept any of the keys, and others will only accept the key for the job that uses them. Part of my job is to secure things like this, so only my key accesses this vault, and both of our keys will grant access to the council chambers. For example, I've got it, said Wilma. Second, the tools of our trade, said Ferneco, taking and handing to Wilma a belt with a holster. Sitting inside the holster was some kind of cross between a collapsing baton and a Swiss army knife and a giant bicycle lock. Or rather, tool. I'm not certain exactly what your uncle used this for, but I never saw him at work without it. If anyone ever saw Mr. Dunn walking along with this in hand, they always knew to stay out of his way. And let me guess, you don't know exactly what it's for or how to use it, do you? said Wilma. I'm afraid not, said Ferneco. I imagine that you'll find something of help at his house, though. Mr. Dunn was always in the habit of leaving himself, you know, little notes, just in case. Fair enough, said Wilma. I'll see what I can puzzle out for myself. Is there anything else? Not here, said Ferneco. The rest is at his house.
approximately 200 yards in uh, that direction. Ferneco pointed towards his door and across the square, his arm wavering slightly as he tried to recall the exact bearing. Tell me, do either of you have any cash about you? I have a little, said Dot, but I mainly use plastic. Well, I brought some for emergencies, said Wilma. Paper currency, I suppose, said Ferneco. Well, yeah, said Dot, her brow furrowed. Why? You may want to stop at the change machine in the square. You'll find things easier that way. Thanks, said Dot. I'll give it a try, I guess. Good day to you both, then, said Ferneco. I look forward to seeing you both again in less formal circumstances. It was good to meet you, Mr. Ferneco, said Wilma. Thanks again. Yeah, I guess we'll see you around, Latimer, said Dot. They left the law office, both feeling a little dazed, and walked into the town square. It had a big fountain in the middle, with spouts in all directions, a cafe, a fancy building that looked like a town hall, and a lovely park with benches and gravel paths. The change machine stood in a kiosk all by itself at one end of the park, at the other end of the town hall. As they got closer, they saw that it looked a little like one cash register, with mechanical buttons and an analog readout. There was a big drawer on one side that said, insert here, and a button on the front that said start. Well, why not, said Dot. Let's see what kind of change you're supposed to be using. At worst, I may have to ask you for a loan. Go for it, said Wilma. Dot pulled out the drawer and laid a twenty and two fives from her wallet into it, and then she slid the door shut. The drawer ratcheted as she pushed like something was being wound up. And then, when the drawer was fully closed, there was a click, and the start button popped out. Here goes nothing, said Dot, and she pressed the button. The machine made a series of loud whirs and clanks, more than could possibly be the result of any function. Wilma could have sworn that someone had put all those noises in just to make the machine sound and clank. After a few seconds... Another drawer popped open at the base of the machine with three gold coins in it. Dot pulled them out and examined them, but Wilma recognized them immediately. Well, I guess the change machine works, said Wilma. What do you mean, said Dot? This is not what $30 in change looks like. Not anymore, anyway, said Wilma. That's a double eagle and two half eagles. The U.S. hasn't used the half eagles since the Great Depression, or any other gold coin for that matter, and they never technically issued the double eagle at all. Gold coins, said Dot. She lifted them in her hands. You're right. They are pretty heavy. But how do you know so much about old coins anyway? My uncle had a big collection of old coins, she said, and then she thought about it again in a new light. Wow, I guess he wasn't a coin collector at all. No, said Dot. It looks like he just kept money on him. Ever since hearing about her uncle's will, this was the first thing Wilma had seen that had fit together. She racked her brain, trying to remember all the other things he had told her about. Now she knew what the purpose of all those lessons had been. Hey, look, said Dot, pulling open a little flap on the side of the machine. There's another one of those weird keyholes in here, like the lawyer had on his chessboard. Wilma took the silvery medallion from around her neck and held it in her hand and pressed the small raised circle, like Ferneco had. The medallion opened and began to unfold. It didn't move quite like his had, but at the end, she was definitely holding a key. She inserted it into the hold and twisted, and the display ticked to life. Welcome, Wilma Dunn. The readout spun to reveal a string of numbers, along with indicators reading deposit and withdraw that pointed to some of the other buttons. The amount of money in her uncle's account wasn't as big as part of her had been expecting, but he had clearly been doing all right for himself. She pressed 100 and then withdraw and one hundred dollars in vintage gold coins poured into the drawer. 
Well, how about that? said Wilma. She pulled out the coins and loaded them into a pouch on her new belt. Now I kind of want to see what's in that house, said Dot. And if it's half as cool as the rest of all this, <laughs> which way did he say it was? Should be this way, said Wilma. Follow me. She crossed the square and headed down a leafy street as passers-by watched her and wondered who the new people in town were. The street leading away from the square was mostly shops. They mostly made sense, but again, with one or two things a little off about them. They passed a gas station with a couple of cars parked out front. The pumps had way more options than the ones they were used to back home. The first row made sense, with unleaded, super, premium, and diesel buttons. But the bottom row had buttons for 120V, LH, U235, and H3. Hang on, said Wilma. Who in town is driving a nuclear car? Now I really, really want to see what's in that house, said Dot. When they reached the house, Wilma had her official key at the ready, but there was no place for it. There wasn't a place for any key at all. The door was just unlocked. Must be a real trusting town, said Dot. Come on, let's have a look around. They stepped inside. It looked like the kind of old house Wilma would have expected in a small town. But most of the fixtures and architecture were made of shaped metal instead of wood. And it was also larger than Wilma had thought it would be. Every room was just a little bigger than it needed to be. Instead of feeling cramped and low to the ground like a lot of old houses. Other than that, though, everything more or less made sense. There was a kitchen, dining room, parlor, and coat closet on the ground floor, and bedrooms and bathrooms above. Wilma went to the largest bedroom and opened the closet, where she saw all the clothes she had ever seen her Uncle Amos wear. For the first time, she started to feel the real weight of his loss. And then she looked around at the walls of the bedroom. There were only three framed photos on the walls. One of them had her mom and dad, but all three of them had her and Uncle Amos. One in the middle, the biggest one, she remembered from her high school graduation. Everyone had been making her stand for pictures all day long, but her Uncle Amos had wanted just one of him and her. He looked so proud of her. She brushed her hand against the grip of the weird tool on her belt, and she felt her eyes begin to well up. She tossed her bag onto the bed, looked around the walls again for a more proprietarial feel, and called out to Dot. We should probably head back to the garage to get the rest of our stuff. Maybe Wolfgang will lend us a hand. Sure, in a minute, said Dot. But come take a look at this first. I think I found something. Wilma went down the stairs and found Dot looking through a doorway at the back of the house. She joined her at what turned out to be a staircase leading down. The walls of the upper part were the same style as the rest of the house, but the lower part looked like the walls of a submarine. They weren't even trying to disguise themselves as homey, folksy wood. They were just bare metal, exposed rivets, and welds and all. The stairs went down at least 15 feet, lit by a caged bulb in the ceiling, before they turned into a spiral that was lit by glowing strips set into the curved walls. Whoa, said Wilma. Now we're getting somewhere, said Dot. What do you think it is down there? I haven't the faintest clue, said Wilma. I wonder if any other council members have one of these in their basement. Do you want to go back to that lawyer's house and ask him? That, said Wilma. Or I can see if I can find a really big ball of string somewhere. I mean, I don't want to get lost in the basement on my first day. Just then, there was a dinging noise from the front hall. Wilma went out to find a kind of box mounted on the wall with a little flashing light. A thin strip of paper was inching out of the bottom of the box with something printed on it. Wilma plucked it from the box, and it read, Urgent. Wilma Dunn. Town Square Fountain. She noticed a faint symbol on the front of the box, 
faded with wear. She held up her medallion. It was the same symbol. I guess you have a job to do, said Dot. I guess so, said Wilma. Let's see what's up at the fountain. They jogged back to the town square. The fountain in the middle, which had been spouting water just fine when they first saw it, was dry. People were gathering around, if not actually concerned, then at least curious. A silver-haired middle-aged woman in a leather jacket and black biker jeans turned to greet her when she walked up. Oh, hello, she said. I don't think I've seen you around before. Then she noticed the belt Wilma was wearing, and Wilma spotted an emerald green medallion peeking out from beneath her jacket. So, you're Amos's replacement. His niece, said Latimer Fernaco, trotting up to meet them. Wilma Dunn. This is Dr. Wilhelma Nance, our resident psychiatrist and one of your fellow council members. Charmed, I'm sure, said Wilma. The two of them shook hands. Wilhelma and Wilma, said Dot. We might need to think of nicknames for one of you. Oh, you have no idea, said Dr. Nance. You must be Dot Vander. I see you live up to your profile. There's that feeling again, said Dot. Well, let's talk about it later, said Dr. Nance. Right now, your friend has a job to do. The fountain is just stopped working, said Wilma. It was running fine a moment ago. Well, not really, said Dr. Nance. It hasn't been working at full capacity for the past year. Amos was too sick to keep it going. He was sick, said Wilma. What happened to him? Later, said Dr. Nance. She extended a finger. Focus on the fountain. Remember, just do what comes naturally to you, said Ferneco. No one will tell you how. This is your job. Wilma drew the weird tool from her belt and walked up to the fountain. It was surrounded by townsfolk but they stood aside for her as soon as they saw her carrying the tool. The looks they were giving her weren't quite worshipful, but they were close. She was here to do a job. She was a member of the council. She would know what to do. That was what their looks were telling her. She would know what to do. This was her job. The water at the base of the fountain was still. At the bottom of the stone basin, Wilma saw a long, wide strip of concrete, slightly raised and off-color from the rest. She looked in the direction it was pointing, and she saw a round metal plate in the ground. It was about the size of a manhole, but there was no lid to lift. There was just a spiral pattern at the center, surrounded by a ring of metal with a pattern of holes in it. Each hole was ringed with iridescent blue. Latimer Fernico had said that her uncle liked to leave notes for himself. But... If they were anything like the rest of the town, these notes wouldn't be slips of paper lying around. Wilma took a closer look at the tool. It had lots of apparently moving parts, but the only thing that looked adjustable was a ring above the grip, with a small arrow that could be twisted to point at a series of colored stripes. She twisted the ring to point at a blue stripe, and the tool began to unfold. Prongs and jointed arms extended from the central shaft, pivoted into place, and locked tight. What she was left with was a kind of pry bar with an extra handle at the far end and a series of gripping teeth in the middle, kind of like a metal ship's wheel with only one spoke, or maybe like the world's largest drill chuck key. The gripping teeth lined up perfectly with the holes in the plate on the ground. She inserted the teeth, grabbed both handles, and twisted. The ring rotated a quarter turn, and the spiral at the center of the plate irised open, revealing a familiar keyhole. She removed her tool, unfolded her key, and turned it in the lock, causing the entire plate to descend into the ground with her on it. Now she was looking at a jumble of pipes below the town square, It wasn't anything like the water heater in her parents' basement that Uncle Amos had taught her about, but she could see what pipes were whole, which ones were hastily patched, and which ones needed to be replaced. She didn't know where she could get replacement pipes for any of this, 
But then she noticed the other pipes, the narrow ones that wove in and out of the mains. She couldn't figure out what they were for, but all of their locking collars, valves, and joints were painted in bright green. She twisted the tool's control again. Now it looked like a wrench, albeit a wrench with two or three extra jaws and an extra hinge and a light at the front. She started adjusting valves and tightening joints, and the smaller pipes began to glow bright green. The cracks in the larger pipes began to close. Water sprayed everywhere, and some of the other joints threatened to loosen all at once and outright burst. But Wilma kept at it, forcing the arcane plumbing to yield to her will. With every problem she spotted, she had a brief flash of a time in her childhood when Uncle Amos had told her about a similar one. At some point in her youth, he had told her about things like this. Not exactly the same, but just to the side of them. It was as though he was standing beside her, encouraging her forward and watching over her with the same kind smile on his face. Right at the end, she remembered him again, but not from anything he had taught her. She remembered talking to him about college on the same day he had taken that picture of the two of them. Her parents had had a plan for her, wanting her to get a good education so that she could start a career that would help her find a place in the world. Uncle Amos had never talked about plans. He only ever talked about hope. He just hoped that she would find something for herself. Maybe the reason he never made a plan, thought Wilma, was because he hadn't needed to. Maybe he'd always known what had been waiting for her. At long last, the final pipe was whole. The joint stopped rattling and groaning, and the fountain was working again. Wilma turned her key back, and the platform carried her up into the town square. She pulled her key out and used the tool to reseal the hole, and then she looked up. The fountain was spouting arcs of water from one end of the basin to the other in multicolored spurts, making rainbows dance around the square in the waning light of evening. The people of the town smiled at the sight, lounging around the park, enjoying the view as the setting sun bathed the town in gold. Wilma just stood there, though, her hair and clothes soaked halfway through, her medallion hanging from her neck the tool resting on her shoulder, as though she did work like this every day. Dot ran up to her and hugged her. You did it. Yeah, I did the job. I guess so. You certainly did, said Dr. Knotts, strolling over to them. And good as new as well. Well done. She shook Wilma's free hand in hers. Welcome to Crate. With that, Wilma and Dot stood all alone by the fountain, surrounded by the people of Crate at the end of a long day. You know, said Dot, I think I'm going to like it here. Yeah, said Wilma. I think I will too. folks, that's tonight's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, you heard Welcome to Crate, the first in the News from Crate series by Nathaniel Hicklin. Next week, we will return to Crate. We will meet some new people. We will go to some new places and we will uncover more and more secrets. So please stick with us for that. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it on social media. I bet your friends will like it too. And if you really want to support us, head on over to patreon.com slash sickseperserpent. And for a dollar a month, you can read every story in the archive, every one of them. And for $3 a month, you can get early access to new episodes of this podcast weeks before anyone else.
The text for this episode, as well as the audio, were produced by me, Michael Strand, managing editor at Six Emperor Serpent. This episode was authored by Nathaniel Hicklin, Six Emperor Serpent writer, and this episode was published by T. Martin Krauss, editor in chief at Six Emperor Serpent. And finally, the music for tonight's episode is by the producer Lackey Inspired. Find more of his work at soundcloud.com slash lackeyinspired. Thank you so much for listening and for subscribing. We'll see you next time on the Everlasting Stories podcast. Thank you.